All right, we're gonna get started. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes? Good, okay, great. So I wanna welcome everyone um, to our 2022 Fall Department of Art Visiting Speaker Series. And for those of you that are joining us for the first time tonight, I'm Stephanie Rothenberg. I'm an art professor and the current chair of the Department of Art. And I'm host of the series for this fall. The series runs every fall for 15 weeks on Monday nights at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time and features internationally recognized artists, designers, and other cultural producers. The, the series has resumed being in person here in Buffalo, New York at the University of Buffalo, but there's still a few lectures that are on Zoom. And um, I'll post the link in the chat so that if you live in the area or are passing through town, you can join us. So tonight I am thrilled to have with us the esteemed eco-artist Aviva Romani, whose talk is entitled Critical Thinking About Practice. So along with discussing selections of her expansive art practice, Aviva will also read excerpts from her new book, Divining Chaos, Chaos, the Autobiography of an Idea. So before we begin, the Department of Art would like to acknowledge the land on which the University of Buffalo operates. It is the territory of the Seneca Nation, which is a member of the Haudenosaunee Six Nations Confederacy. And this territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty of Peace and Friendship, a pledge to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. It's also covered by the 1794 Treaty of Canandaigua between the United States government and the Six Nations Confederacy, which further affirmed Haudenosaunee land rights and sovereignty in the state of New York. New York. And today, this region is still the home to the Haudenosaunee people, and we are grateful for the opportunity to live, work, and share ideas in this territory. So I'd like to give a brief introduction of Aviva Romani. She's worked at the cutting edge of the avant-garde since she committed to her career at the age of 19. She's devoted many years of her working life to teaching, inspiring, and leading others through her art to a renewed focus on ecological restoration as art making. The renowned feminist art historian Lucy Lepard calls Aviva, and I quote, a leading visionary in crucial current debates around climate change and environmental innovation. She sees artists as cultural first responders, end quote. Aviva's work has been included in shows at many venues, including the Thomas Urban Gallery in New York City, various small fires in Los Angeles, the KRICT Gallery in Daejeon, South Korea, the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art in Boulder, Colorado, the Hudson R River Museum in New York, the Cincinnati Center for Contemporary Art in Ohio, and the Joseph Boys 100 Days of Conference Pavilion that was for the 2007 Venice Biennale in Italy. She earned her PhD from the University of Plymouth in the UK and received her BFA and MFA at the California Institute of the Arts. She's also an affiliate with the Institute for Arctic and Alpine Research at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Her current interdisciplinary art project, Blue Trees, which has been widely written about in the media and academic journals, challenges the legal basis to build fossil fuel infrastructures. Using biodegradable buttermilk-based ultramarine blue paint, she joins forces with hordes of fellow environmental supporters to mark the paths of pipelines blocking them from barging through the land to destroy habitats, water, and forests. As I mentioned, she just published her new book, Divining Chaos, the Autobiography of an Idea, this year from New Village Press. Divining Chaos is a feminist personal memoir with a complex analysis of the impact of ecological art. Aviva's goal for the book is to open up relationships to, and I quote, wider global biogeographic systems to tell the big story of the future. I'm so honored to have you here, Aviva, um, joining us tonight. So without further ado, let's please welcome Aviva Romani. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was a fabulous introduction and I am delighted and honored to join you all. And I wanted to title this critical thinking about practice because as some of you may have noticed, we seem to be in an era that conflates opinion with critical thinking. And I think it's very important to separate the two. And as artists, what we do is we look at problems from a very multidimensional way. It's, it's not just research about who's investigating or what the history is. It's also how we experience with our senses the issues that concern us. So this is what concerned us today, the funeral of Queen Elizabeth. And like many people, I was very moved by what I saw. The music was fabulous. There's only one or two little problems. One is the Mau Mau uprising that um, victimized many people in Kenya at the beginning of her reign. The money that comes from Canadian tar sands that supports the uh, monarchy. And the consequences of global warming, which come from corporations that are invested in fossil fuels such as the monarchy. So what is the problem? The problem is that we have entities in the world right now who are in effect perpetrating ecocide, which is based on ideas about genocide. And I would argue that ecocide may be the inevitable result of patriarchal systems. And I just want to clarify quickly that when I use the word patriarchy, I'm not talking about gender. I'm talking about the concentration of power. What is the antidote to the concentration of power? One of the things that I've learned from my indigenous friends is the validation of the importance of transparency and trust and vulnerability. So I'm going to show you a bunch of work and talk about a bunch of ideas. And what I want to show you as young people, especially, is how throughout one's career, various ideas evolve and develop and expand. This is a still from a piece in 1969 called the pocketbook piece, where three women just walked out into the middle of the audience dumped out the con entire contents of their pocketbooks and then started talking, free associating to the audience about what those objects were. So I remember vividly one of the women said, oh, and this is the lipstick I wore the night that I was raped. That's a communal relationship to knowledge and creation. So one of my big projects over the past, oh, 12 years since 1999 my arithmetic is horrible uh 22 years was to create a community of ecological artists and out of that we finally produced this book which is different than my book uh, about uh, how to go about teaching ecological art the 67 essays in it back in 1972 I did a very short project when I was in Alan Capro's class, which was collecting water from CalArts, and we drove to the ocean, and in a very ritualized process, we slowly dumped the water into the sand, the land, the plants, until we got to the ocean where we dumped out the rest of the water. Then we collected more seawater and drove all the way back to CalArts where we flushed it down the toilet. This, wow. was called, <laughs> this was called physical education. Oh, wait, you just got muted. Uh, how did that happen? Did you hear the last phrase about devaluing water? Can you say that one more time? Yes, I can. Uh, this was a project about how we devalue water. Fresh water was collected. It was driven to the sea. We returned with seawater and flushed it down the CalArts toilet. And it was about how we devalue water. It was called physical education because we learn to devalue our environment. 
From 1976 to 1979, I recorded all the dawns and sunsets from one view, it was actually my ex-husband's backyard, and the idea was to capture all the dawns and sunsets before they put in threatened oil rigs. And this is the dawn from this morning. So this is a carryover theme all these years later. In 2010, I got very interested in what was going on in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is just an image of the bayous on my way to Baton Rouge. And this was part of my research. Now, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that there are so many ways to do research. This is research I did at Scripps Oceanography of the dynamics of a wave. And this was a painting that I did in 1994 of the waves here on Vinyl Haven Island, where I live now. And this was an installation in 1982 about women and childbirth. And what you see to the right are a series of panels that represent waves. <laughs> Um, that uh, are what it felt like at the time for me when I felt a wave of hormones to have children. Um, I grew up, I weathered it. And here the waves come again in rocks that I installed at the local ferry terminal. That was in about 2000. And here are the rocks again, just recently as I started to incise them to insert crushed glass. Uh, right now we have the blue crushed glass and there's going to be green crushed glass representing breaking waves. So out of all this, I began to try to figure out what is the nature of change. Eventually I did a dissertation and the dissertation identified six rules to create a complex adaptive model out of disparate agents. And these are the rules. They came down to ideas from thermodynamics and quantum mechanics about uh, how there's always an entry into a small chaotic system and the paradox of urgency is that there, there is time to change. We must layer information to test our perception. And then also metaphors are idea models and play will teach, which is basically what all art is. So in 1990, I bought the local town dump on Vinyl Haven Island. And what you see is an image from 1930s of what the land looked like. It wasn't even really land, it was made land. And I decided that I would spend the next 10 years restoring it. And the insert is a detail from the restored estuary. This was the metaphor that inspired me. What you're looking at are the lost drift nets that I retrieved from the town dump. And these are the ghost nets that get lost in the ocean and they strip mine the sea of all marine life. I was very interested in fish. I've always had this uh, parallel interest in science and art and they pretty much merge in my practice at this point. But what I was thinking was that if I could restore this small point of land, it actually was at a critical point in the Gulf of Maine, then it might create a supportive environment for fin fish and specifically by making the region habitable for eelgrass. And then I carried over that idea to look at the Gulf of Mexico and the dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico and where could we intervene in the upper half of the Mississippi water basin to restore some health to the Gulf. And this is just a detail from a project that was called Fish Story, which I did with uh, two of the scientists I work with, Jim White and Jean Turner. And what we did was we identified, in fact, a small point on the Wolf River, Wolf River, a tributary into the Mississippi River, whose restoration might have affected the entire region. And here's back to ghost nets. And what you see in the middle, that little line is the highest known surge line from storms, spring storms. And here it is in detail, where after the excavation for the first time in 100 years, fresh water met salt water. 
And that's what it looks like today. That's the east side of the land and that's the west side of the land. So I thought, well, okay, if I can restore that, let's look at some other sites that might have critical significance. And so I, I did a drawing that analyzed the relationships between various species and the habitat on the rest of the island and found a point uh, in the upper left that connected two parts of the island, but the the connection had been obstructed by a causeway. So at the causeway, I painted the boulders around it. I think there were about 30 or 40 large boulders with the same blue slurry that will come up later. Um, and I mixed it with moss so it would grow moss. And I'm going to quickly make a long story short, which was that the town subpoenaed me to clean the rocks. I had a wash in for the rocks. And the outcome was so much attention that the USDA contributed over $500,000 to restore the area. And that's what it looks like now. Pretty cool, huh? Um, so with my friends, Jean and Jim, we started looking at uh, some of these larger relationships on an intercontinental basis. And with Jim, I did a film called Trigger Points, Tipping Points, where we compared a series of deltaic regions that were also um, locations of conflict, making the connection between conflict zones and glo global warming. So this is one image from that. Well, that didn't do it. I, I had this naive idea that all I had to do as an artist was point my finger at how horrible things were and what the solution was. and uh, that didn't work. So I tried to get a little bit more practical and I had a group of activists connect with me and they had heard about Peter von Tiesenhausen in Alberta, Canada, who had copyrighted his entire ranch. And they said, well, can we copyright the forests so that the natural gas pipelines can't go through the forest. And I said, no, we can't do that. That's what Monsanto does. But we could copyright a relationship between us and the trees and an artwork. So what you see on the lower left is a map of a one third mile measure of a complete symphony in which each note is actually a tree and that's what you're seeing on the right. You're seeing tree notes. And from an aerial perspective, the musical section you see on the top left, and I don't know if I dare use my voice because I haven't really warmed up today, but it goes, and that became the basis of a symphony. And we copyrighted it. And that was my conceptual impression of what we were doing from another site. There are quite a number of sites that we use. This one is from Virginia. And again, you're looking at one note. And this is a detail of the bark. It was completely fascinating to me from a painterly point of view to see how the color of the bark was visible through the paint. And since it was buttermilk, it created a secondary habitat for all kinds of critters and in effect a secondary symphony as well, since they made their own sound. So this is how I conceived of it intercontinentally. The gold is the locations of popu human population density. And then the bars of music are how the music would create contiguity between habitat and the blue dots are locations where we had done the Blue Tree Symphony. The blue lines around the continents are where sea level rise will leave us if we don't do anything. So there were a number of installations I did exploring this idea further. This one was in South Korea and it was projecting where there might be remaining habitat after sea level rise that would have to support all terrestrial life. And this one was in Virginia, and there were a series of panels with- mm, so good. Uh, somebody needs to be muted. 
there were a series of panels suspended in the space and the um there was immersive sound in the space of birds <laughs> from, from a specific location and the panel said things like this one uh, what we have to pay attention to are the arguments over owners rights and rights in general because it comes down to what we value so we had a mock trial a blade of grass with whom i had a fellowship um, produced this mock trial which created a template for lawyers to use to fight this in court now i have to give you a caveat on this i talked to a lot of lawyers they did not want to prosecute this in a court of law. And the reason was that at that time, the legal profession was absolutely beset by corporate lawyers who ruined any lawyer that in effect tried to challenge them, unfortunately. But we did win an injunction. So in another time and another place we could fight this in the law what we were fighting was eminent domain law that's the process of taking land to install natural gas pipelines and what we said was that my copyright of this work preempted taking the land under eminent domain and what you're looking at here is a witness listening to a tree and what she's listening to is the sound of the tree bearing witness to a massacre so a lot of art making is about creating metaphors and last summer i did a virtual residency studying the distribution of high intensity fires across the world with a fire modeler, Olivia Haas at King's College. And what we decided was that we had to think of fire very much, I think, the way Native Americans might think about fire as a species to protect rather than to fear. So, um, Taylor, could you take this text and put it in the chat, please? because it's a series of uh, connections to videos that people could look at. And the reason I'm not going to show them in uh, this talk is I can't stand the sound that I get over Zoom. But you can look at this on your own. I'm going to read you two excerpts from my book now. And I'm leaving as much time as I can for questions and answers. So. Hopefully, um, you will have questions and I can try to answer, but we can also go back to specific slides as I answer the questions in case there are things you want me to clarify. So I'm going to, the first one I'm going to read is on dominion. When I first encountered debates around the word dominion and care in the King James Bible, I was impressed by the writings of the Episcopalian theologian, Bishop, Bishop John Shelby Spong. Spong's exegesis of how the translation of biblical terms for care became dominion. That further clarified what I already knew about the devastating connection to manifest destiny in the United States the idea that God entitled white Christian men to sovereignty over the earth and other races. In discussions with people from churches, I learned that that idea hinged on the bias of the monarchist translators of the times for the King James Bible. The Aramaic original of the word care referred to husbandry of other life. In effect, the noble priesthood, now we're coming back to the monarchy, enshrined in the legal system, which is the basis of the American legal system as well, and exported that idea to other countries, the idea that one ruler 
can extract anything and everything he wants from the entire earth. The implication to me was that a single word could be so powerful that it would legitimate destroying countless lives. As with my contemplation earlier of 9-11, that new information brought home to me how small a point of inflection could turn a whole world. And now I'm going to read you from the fourth chapter of my book, which is about rape. Just as rape may be a form of spiritual murder, the removal of keystone elements of a habitat threatens the heart of the entire system, leaving it chaotic and unreliable. When Anglos decimated the herds of buffalo that the Plains Indians depended on, that was precisely what happened. They destroyed the Plains Indians' spirits as much as their livelihoods. To seal the deal, they built railroad lines in the path of buffalo migration corridors. Native Americans have been persecuted from the birth of this nation. They called George Washington the town destroyer because he burned 40 native settlements to ashes when the Iroquois resisted becoming assimilated farmers. In his writings, he was explicit about his intention to destroy their spirit along with their habitat. Deforestation as a weapon of war has a long history. The United States deployed Agent Orange de defoliating swaths of land in Vietnam. Ancient Romans broke the resistance of the fabled Druids of the British Isles by destroying their old growth forests, reducing them to the fields of colorful heath so familiar to tourists ever since. Habitat loss occurs for many reasons, including some that aren't anthropogenic. For example, when a wetland becomes a meadow and then a forest. Wholesale destruction is typical of wars, but landscapes can disappear in the absence of war when humans steadily encroach on an intact system to gather firewood, hunt indiscriminately, build roads or gather timber, incrementally endangering the integrity of the whole. Trees are cut to build houses and warm people. Oceans are overfished to feed them. Livestock are set loose to graze on saplings before those animals also become a meal. The forests and waters of the world deserve the same empathy and restraint we might have for other victims of human violence. If we felt our fear of losing water, a habitable climate, or pollinators as our own loss, not only the loss of peace and beauty, might we then hesitate before cutting down another hectare of Amazon forest? Instead, the ecosystem and social ecotones that might protect a habitat or a sexual assault victim are steadily eroded for profit. Besides breaking lethal silence, the genius of the Me Too movement has been to tear apart the prison of isolation inherent in rape culture. That is a restoration process. A similar process takes indigenous species or takes measures to conserve the large tracts of forest land that sustain a habitable earth by providing contiguity and new edge areas. Whether destroying land to win a war or leaving plastic in the oceans or clear-cutting forests, the damage is as irreversible as rape. In the mid-60s, 1960s, none of this was clear to me. Not the missing love or the inexorable exercise devouring the earth. What was clear was my instinctive need to live in another system. Like so many young people in the 1960s, I heard a clarion call for change. Few of us understood a relationship between change and empathy as a practical strategy. I certainly did not. And that is my talk. And I have left as much time as I could, as I said, 
so that I could hear from all of you. Thank you, Aviva. Um, we do have a lot of time, so we could show one or two videos. It might be helpful just visually to give a little context. Sure. And if they do sound terrible, then we won't do it. Sure, let me see if this will give you a direct link. Okay, I mean, I could um, also, we could try it and see how it works. Um, I call the first witness, artist Aviva Romani, to the stand. Since Katrina in 2007, I had decided to focus on climate change. In this case, what I decided was that we had to stop fossil fuels. We could stop fossil fuels with the strategy of creating art, copywriting the art, and then contesting eminent domain. Seeing the project go to trial had been my vision from the very beginning. Ms. Rahmani, you testified during your direct that you were invited to create your work of art. Correct. Um, can you describe, well, first of all, who invited you? Hello, Ms. Van. Um, are you the owner of land on which the Blue Tree Symphony is located? Yes. Okay, I would like to show you Plaintiff's Exhibit F. Yes, that's our, that's our land. Could, yes, could you tell me what- A group of activists had approached artists looking for somebody that could possibly copyright trees to stop the natural gas pipelines that were going through New York State. At that time, that was the Constitution pipeline. When they showed me the pipelines that they were concerned about, what I immediately saw was that it looked like musical lines. And I thought, gee, wouldn't that be a fascinating installation to figure out ways to designate the trees along those cor corridors as notes and chords in a symphony. It was a statement in each case about the community taking ownership of their own habitat and their own watershed. The Blue Tree Symphony was installed where people anticipated natural gas pipelines were likely going to take their land by eminent domain. Good afternoon, Ms. Van. Good afternoon. Are you familiar with the process known as eminent domain? Yes, I am. And how have you come to be familiar with that process? More recently, I became familiar with it when the property that uh, is part of Reynolds Hills was taken by eminent domain uh, after the Blue Trees uh, Symphony was installed there, not before. The legal issue in Aviva's case is that where she created the Blue Tree Symphonies, certain companies decided to come in and through eminent domain take the land for gas pipelines and thereby destroy her artwork. So it's really the contest between eminent domain and Vera that were, was the legal issue in Aviva's case. Vera provides that an artist's expression of an idea, which is their artwork, uh, cannot be modified, damaged, or destroyed in a way that would harm the reputation or honor of the artist. There was a very interesting problem with the Visual Artists' Rights Act, which is that it will not pr protect activism. The argument of the other side was, first of all, that Aviva had purposely done the artwork to stop the gas pipeline, which again looks like what we call in court, sometimes we say you come into court with unclean hands, it means 
you, you're not really coming before it, honestly. And when did you decide that you were going to create works of art on Ms. Van's land? When I was invited. When were you invited? I believe it was May or June of 2015. If you'll notice in the questioning, they kept trying to bring up that she knew about it in advance because a court might not like to see that someone created an artwork just to stop a pipeline when the law we're trying to use just protects the artwork. Or maybe they won't care, because does it matter what the motivations are of the artist to create the artwork? What if she did do it to stop the pipeline? What's wrong with that? I was curious myself, how would a judge view this? All rise. American legal system is a, a essentially a passive system until someone activates it. So a judge or jury only decides an issue brought before them. If no one brings a case before them, the issue doesn't get decided. They don't operate sua sponte or on their own. They need to be stimulated by someone bringing a controversy in front of them. So the problem with eminent domain is that developers or gas companies have a lot of money so they can further their agenda through the legal system with large teams of lawyers that can go in and make cases for eminent domain versus the other side which might be few simple landowners that don't have the resources to combat large corporate interests who's representing the land or the landowner this is the question Peekskill, New York, and Blacksburg, Virginia, we did all we could to contest the pipelines. And we were not successful. We held them off for a while, and then they created agreements with the local regulatory people. Uh, they have gone ahead, and the last I heard, they were trucking in the actual concrete pipes. Mr. Nightshade, by whom are you employed? by Nature's Reservoir Gas Company. And what is your title and job description? I'm the Vice President for Public Affairs. Um, what is the purpose of gas pipelines? Uh, the purpose, of course, is to uh, efficiently and effectively extract uh, the, the natural resources for the public good. It's to ultimately provide uh, the energy resources uh, for the entire world. Well, eminent domain is um, provided for under the Fifth Amendment, so it's a constitutional provision, which provides that property cannot be taken without just compensation. Today, it's used to take land away from property landowners under color of for the public good. So that, of course, um, asks the question, what is the public good and who's deciding what the public good is? Uh, does your company have a political action? Group, yes, we, yes, we do. And has it contributed to the election campaigns of the state's government? Yes, we have. And the attorney general? Yes. And the president? That's correct. No further questions. Sir. <laughs> How are the courts looking at social value? community value and that's what I think this comes down to how are we going to litigate cultural rights social rights water rights right now we aren't set up to do that in the court system but we better start thinking about this or we won't have any of those rights if the only definition of public good is that private corporations make money we're lost my task as an artist is not just to see another universe, but to manifest it. Manifest it in a way that's as beautiful and powerful and compelling and poetic as I can make it, or I don't have any argument at all. You may step down. Thank you.
Are there any others that you would want to show? Maybe shorter ones that maybe show more of the project? I know there's a five minute video. I don't know if that would help give it a little more context. Sure, let's see if we can get back there. Um, you know what, it might be easier. I'm worried that if I close this off, I'm gonna, oh, I knew this would happen. Um, Taylor, is it possible that you could open up that shorter video? Let me see. Um, let me check. Whoops, sorry. Um, yeah, can we open this one? Um, oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay, here we are. Using copyright law to contest eminent domain law. It's an untested area of the law. The specific legal terminology is the moral rights of the art under the Visual Artist Rights Act. And then in public domain, and again, this is a legal term, they're doing it for the public good. So the conversation we need to have is what is the public good? And we know that as long as they continue uncontested, and right now they're uncontested, we will continue to have this proliferation of infrastructure. What we need to do is stop and have the conversation about how we transit to transitional fuels, and that is not natural gas, within the next two years, not the next 50 years.
not by 2050, we'll be all gone. That was great. I really like that video. Um, I like both of them together. It's good to see kind of an overview of the project more visually and then as well as the mock trial. Should I stop share? Um, no, uh, that was that was the one you just showed, right? The one that just came up. I think I think that's pretty good. Um, I think helping to give more of an overview. Um, uh, and shell drilling in the so Arctic. So I'm going to stop sharing. What's happening right now in Texas okay. that okay. I'm involved with. What's happening uh, I don't in know New how York we got State into that other with video. the Algonquin uh, pipeline um, and uh, the nuclear facility. Can we stop it somewhere? There. <coughs> and we're going to talk about... I think you just have to stop your video, right? <laughs> okay. Now I'm going to start, start coughing. Um, so yeah, so we, I mean, we have, you know, it's still a good chunk of time to have some discussion. And I think it's really interesting to see um, this whole chronology of your work. And especially, you know, you, you interacted uh, and worked with and collaborated and were part of a lot of events with some, you know, artists, uh, other, you know, really established, well-known artists from the 60s and the 70s. So it's always fun, you know, to hear about your experiences. Um, one question, I'll, I'll just start with a few questions um, to kind of warm up the uh, our audience. But um, something that we discussed before in conversation, um, and that's why I think it was helpful to see the video which shows a little more of the creative um, artistic process, process in relation to the mock trial, which is also performative in its own way, um, are how your more traditional skills as an artist have kind of fed into, you know, this huge project that has many stakeholders and participants in it. <coughs> um, how that really, you know, being an artist, how that really informed what you're doing now. I guess that's the first part of the question. You know, the painting of the trees, the musical score and composition and the singing. And then the second part are what are some of the new skills that you've developed and had to develop in order to do, you know, this really broad interdisciplinary work that brings together so many people from, you know, different fields to make this happen. Does that make sense? Uh, standing on one foot or? <laughs> Just talking about, yeah, your skills and in and, and painting, you know, as a painter and so, singing so and songwriting. What, this is what I think about different skills. Um, I think they're like switching lens on an old fashioned camera. Now we all use just the uh, whatever our iPhone is or Samsung. Uh, but in the old days, we had uh, 10 different lenses. And they gave us something a little different when we looked through the viewer. I think I see something really differently when I think musically than when I think as a painter. And in those six rules for trigger point theory, I say that we can only get an accurate view when we layer as much as possible. So all the different skills I have are, are really just different viewpoints on the same problem. As far as what I learned, 
I'm constantly learning. Right now I'm working on an opera and I'm learning about what drama really is in a libretto. I can't, for example, have a narrative where the uh, perpetrators of ecocide are all evil or it's not interesting. And I'm still struggling with that one. How do I make the evil perpetrators whom I loathe nice, appealing, charming? So far, I'm stuck there. Well, but operas have evil characters. <laughs> True, but they have to have something about them that's appealing or you don't care what happens to them. I was at a conference with, um, it was a Native American conference called Rising Voices. And one of the topics was, how do we make an environment that's really receptive for Native American uh, earth science students? Because many find it very, very hostile. And one of the elder women said that um, the whole task is to operate from a base of love. And the problem is that many of us in the Western world don't operate from a base of love. And it's very easy to flip over to a base of hatred, or at the very least rage, or at the very least fear. So how do you keep out of all of that? That's something I'm trying to learn. I think that's a really good question. Um, we have a question I see from uh, Julia Rose Sutherland, who's one of our uh, one of our alums. Uh, so Julia, hi Stephanie. Hi everyone. I'm not camera ready, but uh, I I wanted to chime in a little bit. I was really moved by your talk. Uh, I, as Stephanie said, I'm a, an alumni to the MFA program at UB, but I'm also uh, an indigenous Mi'kmaq artist from Turtle Island uh, whose work deals with resource extraction um, and rights of the land. So uh, a lot of the, the work that you're talking about and the work that you're doing really resonates. Um, and I think it's really wonderful. And so thank you so much for sharing um, all of your um, your insight and your practice. Um, I was curious, and I think that you've kind of touched a little bit uh, on this, but thinking about uh, how a lot of your practice really resonates with Indigenous ways of thinking and ways of working, collaborating with the land um, and reciprocity with the land. And so I was wondering um, what nations that you collaborate with and who do you work with and who do you um, learn from? And then also to get your sense about ideas of um, right, the rights of land. Um, like, as you may know, since the early 2000s, um, many activists have worked to uh, give personship to land, which is an indigenous way of thinking um, entirely but the idea that a river has personship or personhood um, and that around the world this is happening um, and becoming uh, a bright so granting human rights to um, non-human entities and I wanted to get your perspective about that thank you so much thank you so much uh, what wonderful questions I don't know if I can answer them all but um, let me tell you a little bit of my takeaway from the conference I was at last week one was because this comes up all has come up throughout my career working with indigenous people and I've, I've worked with people from many different tribes mostly in a relatively limited capacity although well I'll, I'll talk about that later um one of the things we talked about was what is the protocol what is what are the appropriate things that indigenous people have a right to ask before Westerners come in and just take what they please. And I think there's a real issue there, uh, and I'm being reductivist, but I think the position I understand from the indigenous people I've ever spoken to is the attitude is, what can I give? And the attitude of white Westerners, unfortunately, is very often, what can I take? And that's not even a question of asking permission. It's just a question of they just take what they want. Um, and I think I did that too at times in my life because I just didn't know any better. But 
I was talking about this in one particular breakout group and I asked the tribal people who, who were there, how can I respectfully ask? And the native elder said, well, the particular tribe I come to starts by having a gift very often with tobacco. And it doesn't have to be a big fancy gift. It can just be a, a ribbon. Um, and you offer the gift with the utmost respect and humility. And what I took away from that was it's not ultimately about the ask, and it's certainly not about what you're going to get. It's about the willingness to give and then wait and see what happens. And yes, of course, I'm very aware of earth rights. I followed it extremely carefully. I've been interested in indigenous thinking since I was a little girl and first read the Song of Hiawatha. Um, I didn't understand anything about uh, the author or uh, any of the other issues, but something came through that resonated for me. And for years, I would go walking in the woods with my dog and, and try to try to not make sounds when I walked on the leaves. And that was my tiny way of trying to understand something that I just intuitively was drawn to. I, I think I was kind of born a, a defiant, um, angry feminist. And um, I, I think what I intuitively understood about many of the indigenous tribes I've learned about is that it's a matriarchal society, it's not patriarchal, and it's a society that allows people to have feelings and to respond to life and be respectful of life, whether it's the leaves you're walking on or a river. So I don't know if that even begins to answer your question, but that's the best I can do. Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I think uh, you encapsulated a lot of, of what I was asking. I just, uh, yeah, I'm just happy to hear from about your practice. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for honoring me by attending. And I'd love to know more about your work. Yeah, well, maybe we should have a studio visit. I would love that. <laughs> that sounds very cool. I, I can connect to both of you. You definitely should. I think that would be really exactly. wonderful. And I have other Native American artist friends that maybe uh, Winter Brown is one of them, Bibankwe. Uh, maybe you want to be in touch with her too or other people. Yeah, this is great networking, y'all. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> are there any other questions? Let's see. People are being a little shy. Um... Or criticism. Tell me I'm full of it. Without heckling. <laughs> yeah. One of the great historians of our times right now is Heather Cox Richardson, and she always emphasizes how important it is to have an honest two-party system politically. Because no matter how much you disagree with somebody else, when you engage in discourse, you have the opportunity to hone your own thinking and to have your arguments challenged. And that's incredibly useful for all of us. So I really do welcome if somebody wants to say, hey, you know, I, I, I see art totally differently. The other thing I wanted to say about um, painting and performance, and I thought about this a lot because of the studio visits this morning, there were a lot of people who paint. And for me, painting, it's kind of like doing piano scales. It's absolutely essential to my practice, drawing and painting. It, it's how I learned to speak as an artist. And it's how I still think as an artist. When I'm trying to work out a problem, I pick up my pen and I start drawing. I think we had another question. Um... Stella Marr and uh, Suzanne Thorpe. 
Yeah. So Stella asks, um, I don't know, Stella, Stella is also an alum. Uh, Stella, if you want to turn on your mic and, and just ask it, or if you want me to read it. Um, hi. Hi, Stella. Hi. Thanks hi. for joining hi. us. Hi. Yeah. So great. Um, why don't you read it? So I can even hear if it makes sense the way I asked it. Sure. Um, so Stella was curious about how you approach the edges between where the death and the life of the land is and how you think forward the healing action. That's a wonderful question. Um, back in about 1989, I read a little article that introduced me to island biogeography in Scientific American. And one of the statements was that systems die from the edges. And I found that really a stunning statement because until that point, I thought that um, things happen and whoop, the whole system is gone, but it's not. And that we can see that in our politics today. Nobody came along and said, we're gonna replace democracy. They just nibbled away at the edges of the judicial system. Um, until now, we're facing the possibility that the whole system will collapse. And that's just as true in personal relationships. I'm sure we've all been in those situations with people we loved and respected and admired and thought would be in our lives forever. And then there was one little thing after another, and then all of a sudden, we couldn't deal with them or they couldn't deal with us. And the same is true in the habitat. Uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, one of the things I discussed with Michelle Dion at great length was what happens when you have what they call insults to the environment. One oil spill, eh, you know, maybe you survive. Two oil spills, not so much. Three, four, five, six. Um, I did a little map back in about 1994 of the Gulf of Maine. And in the map, I indicated every source of pollution I could think of. And all of a sudden, I realized I was looking at a map of the Ganges. It was just as polluted. Might look a little prettier, but it's just as poisoned. Wow. And Suzanne Thorpe has asked about the role of listening and listening as a possible method of resistance. I'm sure some of you uh, are familiar with Pauline Alvarez's work on deep listening. She was a friend of mine um, when she, we both lived in California. And I think we were kind of working in parallel tracks because listening is something that I think I've always done. That's why when I took those walks with my dog, they were really educational experiences for me. It wasn't just whether or not I was gonna make noise as I stepped on a dry leaf. And it was inevitable I'd make noise. I wasn't wearing moccasins for one thing. Uh, I wasn't barefoot. I was gonna make noise. Um, but here in Maine, I'm living on Vinyl Haven Island. The summer has passed. The tourists are mostly gone. And as we speak, I have a clock and I don't know if you can hear it, but I can hear the, the tick, tick, tick of the clock. And I find that kind of comforting because it tells me that time is passing and life is moving along. And every day I take a picture of the dawn, unless it's overcast and I post it on Facebook. And that's also about time and it's also about listening because I don't always, I very rarely do the video of the dawn, but when I do, what I'm hearing are a rooster, sometimes the wind. I think listening is a huge part of my practice. And I think it's probably, if we let ourselves be open, a big part of anybody's practice, because it's, it's very arbitrary that we say, oh, visual artists deal with stuff we see or musicians deal with stuff we hear. But actually, as animals, we don't experience the world like that. We experience the world in a very complex way. Did that answer your question, Suzanne? 
oh wait as a possible method of resistance okay so um the purpose of a patriarchy or a totalitarian or a fascist system is you funnel everything towards who's going to benefit who's going to win over everybody else and everything else um to simply position yourself where it's not about winning it's about being receptive and giving and living in a state of love um that's a that's a position of resistance what comes out of it those are the actions you take that's like once you give the gift you may or may not get the answer to your question um being in a position that's responsive to the world instead of uh, operating on the world controlling the world that allows something else to happen and it's unpredictable what that would be but the position alone is an act of resistance i think in effect that's what i continue to learn from my native american friends i, I think a lot of what i understand of indigenous culture is living in a position of listening listening not just to the natural world and to your elders and to the children but they often speak or the people i've known often have spoken about listening to their dreams and listening to their ancestors speak through the dreams that's a very foreign kind of airy fairy idea for most westerners did i answer the question i think you did anything else suzanne <laughs> Another question. You discussed John. technical executive for trees in the field. How was it performed? Okay, so um, each tree note was GPS located, and the GPS location of those trees for each measure corresponded to the melodic refrain that I sang for you that occurs in um, both of the videos as well. Then uh, to create the more complete symphony, I uh, did a synesthetic analysis of the topography from satellite photos to extrapolate uh, the further instrumentation besides the corral. Um, that's one of the big tasks I would have if I go forward with this opera to complete a composition that in an ideal world would would encompass the whole earth. Mm. Let's see, there's a new, okay. I think that covered it. Um, I see that we had another question earlier from Ashley. Um, Ashley, I don't know if you want to add anything more to your question or if you want me to ask it. Your points are conflicting. That's an interesting question. Um, one of my exercises, and I admit I haven't done it very much this summer because I've been busy marketing my book, which I hope you'll all buy. Um, I go to my studio, which is on the edge of deep water, and that view in the first slide where I um, do a land acknowledgement for the Wabanakis, that's actually the view out my studio window, astonishing as it is. And I spend hours there just sitting in a rocking chair, just staring at the water and staring at the light. And then I'll make a small painting. And by small, I mean really small, like eight by eight, 10 by 10 inches. And for 30 years, I've painted exactly the same image, which is that edge point between where the salt water meets the land. And I imagine that I'm documenting sea level rise, except that, of course, that's impossible. And when I paint, I very easily get seduced by the color and the paint and the shapes and the light 
and I go down a rabbit hole of formalism. So once I'm down that rabbit hole, am I still learning anything about sea level rise? I'm not sure. Anything else you want to add, Ashley? We have a question from Jake Wallace. Yeah. Um, do you see it? I, I yeah. can um, maybe be good. Does everybody see it that you, you mentioned? Jake, were you going to ask? Well, as I was gonna say, do you want me to read? It's kind of a long sure. question. Do you want me to no, read it? No, that's great. Or? Yeah, read it. I think it's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hi, Viva. You mentioned that you're working on an opera and that you had trouble making the perpetrators of ecocide not completely evil. My question is what your definition of perpetrator is. Because you started to talk off by talking about the, the, the queen um, who, while not actively on the ground, so to speak, doing imperialism, was definitely a benefactor of it as all of us are to some degree benefactors of the fossil fuel based global economy. Does that make us somewhat all perpetrators? Well, I think we're all complicit simply by being alive. I once did a residency in um, Israel and a poet there, and I always forget his name, it was Dove something, but he's, he read a poem about the perfect ecological man. And he said, the perfect ecological man goes to the Jerusalem forest, that was a big forest in Israel, and he goes to the edge of a cliff and he jumps off. In other words, the perfect, perfect ecological man self-eliminates. I think in, in our culture, and I don't know how Native American people would feel I think it's different, more complicated, another story. But most of us in this culture, our mere existence makes us complicit. It's a big reason, honestly, that I decided not to have children when I was very young. Because um, I just couldn't see how I could reconcile the problems I saw in the environment and adding another person to it. And needless to say, this has been the cause of some very painful conversations with friends of mine who have children. Um, the question is, well, okay, let me put it differently. When I did ghost nets, it was a barren piece of land. It had been strip mined by quarrying and so on. The first thing I did was I planted 400 trees um, deciduous trees. And one reason deciduous trees was because when the English first came to America, they cut down all the deciduous trees for the king's mast for the ships. The spruce trees that have since grown up, and we think of it as the boreal forest, in many ways are a weed species. There would have been at one time a far more complex forest system that would have included a lot of deciduous trees. The reason I planted 400 trees was I calculated when I built my home, which is a tiny house, it's a footprint of about 200 square feet. Um, when I built my house, I wanted to replace all the wood I might use on the house, plus some by the trees that I could plant. So there's no easy answer to what you're asking. Yes, I think we're all complicit. To some extent, I think we can make up for the fact that we're chewing up the earth, um, but we can never compensate for everything we do. We just can't. We're just too voracious. And Reinhardt, I don't know if I answered your question. I probably can't answer your question. But Reinhardt, you also have a question. Um, I've, uh, re I'm rescinding the question. Um, I think you've addressed enough for me, thanks. Um, Jake, did I answer your question at all? I, I think you did, yes, thank you uh, so much. Um, yeah, it's a complicated question. Um, it's, it's hard and I think it's, 
increasingly we, we're sort of running into these uncomfortable questions where there aren't really um, simple answers. I'm not sure it's a complicated question to tell the truth. I think it's a relatively simple cause and effect. If we continue to live the way we have been living, I mean, just shipping alone for the food that we eat, um, so many simple things that we take for granted. When I did ghost nets, that metaphor of the, uh, the fishing drift nets on the bed, what I said about it at the time was that I thought the answer was to escape the trap of the familiar. Our familiar habits and routines of behavior and acting are what's going to kill us, just like the ghost nets kill marine life, strip mine the ocean of all life. Everything that we take for granted is what's going to kill us and, and our neighbors and other species, how do we stop doing that? Well, one of my solutions has been to try to be a humble student of my indigenous friends, because I do think they have a lot of answers. And I'm not just talking about uh, North American Indians. I've gone to seminars with indigenous people from Africa, from Bulgaria. Um, there is a dominant culture across this world that is phenomenally extractive and I would say patriarchal and is not just ecocidal but ecosuicidal. So how do we fight all that? I, I'm really not sure, but I'm pretty damn sure that it's a big problem. Oh, um, Abdul asks, what motivates you? Well, for one thing, I'm phenomenally self-righteous. Um, but the truth is that besides being self-righteous, it really kills me. It really kills me to see the forests that we cut down. It really kills me to see the animals that are lost and dying. Uh, the poverty kills me, the Mau Mau rebellion kills me. Um, Lucy in her, in, in her foreword to my book said something like, she feels compassion for everything. Yeah, I'm a real bleeding heart. Uh, I find it unbearable. Um, I don't think, I, I just can't stand it. it, it it's just too they have set, done studies on people who lose something and uh, the effect on the heart. The effect is just like a heart attack. Um, I take it personally when I lose things. And I'm not the only one losing things, obviously. But uh, what, what motivates me is, is pure desperation. Uh, it's my feelings that motivate me. It's my horror. It's my rage. It's my frustration. And um, as I said, my Native American friends say, hey, you know, try love. Uh, but I come from a place where the anguish is often more powerful than the love. Abdul, did I respond to your question adequately? Yeah, thank you so much. Sure. Um, you guys are asking me really incredibly important questions, and I'm doing my best. Nicole, the individual never have the same leverage as large corporations. Holding them accountable for the debt would be, yeah, yeah. My obsession these days is legal prosecution for ecocide. <coughs> ecocide was defined in 1971. No one has ever been held accountable for ecocide. Um, the perpetrators, the perpetrators are people who actively perpetrate ecocide. Um, yeah, the queen didn't go out and cut down any trees herself. 
I think she would probably be horrified at the idea of killing an animal. Nonetheless, she earned her money, the whole royal family earned their money from the tar sands in Canada that did kill people, does kill people. Climate change that comes from fossil fuels is killing millions of people. And they are mostly poor, vulnerable people who can neither defend themselves against what's happening, nor in many cases escape it. One of the images, and I think it's the fourth image in my PowerPoint, is of the flooding in Alaska. Um, as we all know, there's flooding in Puerto Rico right now. Um, we're going to lose our coastline. Um, the individual will never have the power against a corporation so long as we have the systems we have. That doesn't mean that it can't be overthrown. Um, that's why law is so interesting. Maybe not the legal system we have right now in the United States, but there are international courts. And there is an interest, as was mentioned earlier, in earth rights. Earth rights and ecocide are hand-in-hand -hand arguments. If you protect earth rights, you can't have ecocide. Putin is a war criminal, not just because of all the people he's killing, but because he's perpetrating vast levels of ecocide. He bombed the effing grain supplies in Ukraine. It's, it's, it's incomprehensible. Somebody's going to go after these people eventually. Do you have any projects that you're currently working on? Yes, I'm trying to do my opera. I need money. I'm trying to raise money for my opera. I have somebody who's a wonderful librettist, uh, Susan Yankowitz. Um, I might have a composer I would collaborate with. I'm experimenting with developing it for the metaverse. Um, I am thinking profoundly about it. I've just applied for some fellowships and grants. So far, I don't have any money. I don't think I can do the opera without financing. So that's one of my big projects right now. But the, pro the opera is about the nature of ecocide and the importance of habitat contiguity. And it's based on the transcript from the mock trial. Can you talk a little bit about the types, like where you look for fundraising, the types of places and how you seek that out? You know, is it, you know, are there different- who rejected me? What? Everyone who rejected me. <laughs> you can talk about everybody that rejected you. <laughs> because there's also advantages that they see the project and that they might tell other people about it and money and opportunities. It's always good to apply for things, even if you get rejected, because you don't know who's looking at it. And I've had times where people contacted me through word of mouth because maybe they were on a panel for something. Absolutely. 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 Well, this year so far, I've been rejected by 21 institutions it's it's believe me it is no fun um naifa is telling me that i have to really focus on individual patrons um and my immediate response was i don't have any patrons and then i thought about it and i thought well actually i do have some patrons um and they might have some friends so it's not a hopeless task um the last two proposals i sent in one was for Harvard Radcliffe, the fellowship there, and the other, <laughs> I think of this as my perpetual annual masochistic exercise, the Guggenheim. <laughs> Believe it or not, I think I have applied for the Guggenheim more times than anybody. I started applying for the Guggenheim in 1970. I think with the exception of a handful of uh, years when I abstained, I have perpetrated this masochistic exercise on myself. And yes, it's true that we get attention from um, 
from various people. Keith Lewis at the Guggenheim and I now have a very friendly relationship. <laughs> He's the director of the Guggenheim. Um, and yes, occasionally I do get a grant, like um, a blade of grass. They're not giving out the same fellowships they used to, unfortunately. But there are various new grants. For example, I sat on the panel to design the grant that was um, given this summer for Anonymous Was a Woman, the Environmental Grants, which is a partnership with NIFA. And I applied for that too, and I was rejected. Um, I'm still waiting to hear from the MAP Fund. I have gotten a MAP Fund grant in the past. Um, now let me tell you about the Radcliffe grant because it was really interesting. First of all, um, they don't ask you, how are you going to help our students, which a lot of institutions do. They ask you, what's really interesting about your ideas that other people might also find interesting? And who thinks that you're hot stuff? Um, while I was working on the proposal, I worked incredibly hard. I must have worked for three weeks on the proposal. And at the very end, a few days before it was due, I noticed they had three more questions for 300 words each. One was, what appeals to you about this opportunity? The second one was, um, what would an ideal year look like for you? And the third was, what else do we need to know? What was so interesting about those questions for me was, I am so used to banging my head against a stone wall that I had given up envisioning what could I really do under ideal circumstances. So I had to reopen old wounds to answer those questions. And I grew immensely. So I think that was um, a gift that Radcliffe gave me and God knows what the outcome will be or whether I'll get an answer, but I certainly came away with a gift back. I think that was a great answer. And it is really interesting to hear that a grant does have these different kind of questions because a lot of them can be somewhat formulaic and some of them do you know but but also going through the process of applying especially for a lot of the students you know the majority are undergrads that they haven't gone through this process before and it makes you really think about your own work and what you're doing and how to articulate it and what are the shifts um, kind of like when you put something, to, you kind of think about something, then you make it, and then it turns out to be something completely different, but always that core um, uh, interest is usually there. It just might manifest in different ways. Um, are there any other questions or thoughts or comments? Um, anyone else, feel free to put it in the chat. Well, a couple of things that I want to say, uh, first of all, about the idea of what can the individual do? I think as long as we are stuck in thinking of ourselves individualistically, we will fail. The only way, for example, that we'll head off the radical right right now is if everybody gets out and votes and makes sure that all their neighbors vote. Uh, the only way that um, there will be accountability for ecocide will be if um, people start making noise about it, saying it's it's not okay to walk away with impunity. It's kind of like the Me Too movement for the earth. And then ultimately we have to think it's not, it might not be for us. It might be thinking for the seventh generation because people won't stop having children. And even if there aren't human children, if we make some effort, it will help other species. I 
I'll tell you one more thing about this and then I'll stop talking. <laughs> That's really great. <laughs> I, uh, I often get uh, contacted by uh, younger people, especially younger students. One of the things that's really been gratifying to me is that it's, it seems to particularly be young people who are interested in my work. And what they tell me is that um, I've been doing this forever. It's not like, oh, how about that? Maybe I'll be an ecological artist. <laughs> that's getting a lot of traction. Let me go for that. Um, and so this summer, a high school student contacted me and asked, what's your greatest hope? What's your greatest fear? I loved that question. And I took it to a workshop I did in France. And I added, what's your greatest strength? And throughout the workshop, we came back to those three questions. What's your greatest hope? What's your greatest fear? What's your greatest strength? To the high schooler, I said, my greatest fear is that we'll stay as stupid as we are. My greatest hope is that something is saved for the refugia of the future. My greatest strength is my sheer stubbornness. I think that's a great way to close. That was really wonderful.